Okay, so the next presentation will be by uh, Catherine P Peters. Catherine Peters is a professor at Princeton, where she is chair of the Civil and, and Environmental Engineering Department, and she is director of the Geological Engineering Program. Her research is in the area of environmental geochemistry, and she focuses on mitigation of pollutants in greenhouse, greenhouse gases. Catherine, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I hope you can see my slides. I, I'd like All to good. start start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to be part of this workshop. It's been very interesting over the last couple of days. Well, what I'm going to do today is tell you about a set of experiments using an array of x-ray methods to study mineral reactions at uh, fracture surfaces. And in particular, I'm going to tell you about one novel inoperando experiment that we did and published in es t last year. And if time permits, I'll also tell you about um, a machine learning tool that we have been developing to use um, XRF data to generate mineral maps. I'll start my presentation with some big picture um, thoughts and motivation and context. Uh, before I move on though from this slide, I'll point out that my name is the only name on this slide, but it by no means uh, represents uh, uh, the truth, which is that a long list of scientists, beamline scientists, grad students and postdocs have been involved with, with input and collaboration to what I'm gonna present to you today. Um, the, okay, the subsurface is a busy, busy place and will become even more busy as we move through the 21st century. And in, in the 21st century, we will expand the use of the subsurface for activities that positively affect the climate, including geothermal energy production, energy storage, and permanently disposing of greenhouse gases in the context of geological sequestration. So with this expanded use of the subsurface environment comes great responsibility for safety and reliability of these technologies, but also great challenges in understanding how this is altering the world beneath us. In my own research, I am particularly interested in um, CO2 sequestration underground. And the questions that have motivated me over a number of years now is when we introduce CO2 deep underground, that can be a significant acidic perturbation of the subsurface. And we may inject CO2 into a formation, but we are relying on an overlying shale, for example, as a cap rock to seal that, that formation and seal the CO2 in place. Um, if there are fractures or faults through that cap rock, there could be leakage of CO2 or CO2 acidified brine. And so I'm, we're, we're well aware that many cap rock uh, shales, for example, contain large concentrations of carbonate minerals, which are highly soluble in acidic fluids. And so the, the, the broad question is, does geochemical alteration of flow paths in cap rocks have a potential to jeopardize storage security? And um, that has led to a number of interesting science questions, which are, you know, how does the science, how does the acidification alter the geometry of those surfaces? Um, how does that affect hydrologic prop processes? How does it affect the geomechanical uh, characteristics of that fracture or fault? And also, um, how does it change the, um, the accessibility to minerals or elements of interest, either hazardous or of interest maybe as critical minerals? So today, um, I'm going to go over a body of work with uh, focus on this novel in operando experiment that I mentioned. OK. So this is the screen capture of the ESNT paper that we published last year. And I will just start by acknowledging um, 
the co-authors of this paper, Hung Deng, who is now a research scientist at uh, Berkeley National Lab, was a PhD student in my group a few years back. And um, this is from an experiment that she did back when she was a graduate student. Uh, I also want to acknowledge my current PhD student, Julie Kim, who's done uh, a lot of work that I'm going to show you today. But in particular, I want to give a shout out to Ryan Tapero, who, who contributed substantially to this manuscript, as well as Jeff Fitz. So if you look at the, the diagram on, along the bottom, which has a kind of a, a, um, a half of a synchrotron over here on the left hand side, this, this experiment uses it used a beamline where we could measure X-ray transmission uh, through a rock sample. And so what we did was we, we made a, um, to make this an inoperando experiment, we made a rock sample that was about one and a half millimeters thick. And um, we used PDMS to make a microfluidics channel. And then we flowed acid through that microfluidics channel to measure the um, X-ray transmission over time. And that way we could look, we could measure the, the change in thickness over time. And that gave us information about how the minerals were dissolving over time. Um, the, in this presentation today, I'm not going to show you that particular data about how things changed over time. That was important in that it helped us quantify reaction rates and how they change over time. But I'm going to focus in, in my uh, presentation today on, the, on what we subsequently learned about the textural changes of the fracture surface. Okay, so oh, let me start these going. So this is um, an example of the Eagleford Shale, which was the rock we studied in this experiment. And the, the first thing we did was we did powder um, XRD to look at the bulk mineralogy. For this particular sample that we studied, it's about 70% calcite, which is quite a bit. But the texture of the rock means that that calcite is organized in terms of sedimentary bedding layers. And that's a, that's a very um, interesting thing when you're thinking about how that how those reactive minerals, meaning the carbonates, are going to dissolve and how that's going to change the geometry and texture of the rock in the fracture surface. Okay, so now I'm, uh, the, the experiment is done. And one of the things we did was we, we subcored um, the, we subcored the, um, the reacted fracture surface, or the reacted rock orthogonal to the plane of the fracture surface. And if you see my cursor, we have this little hockey puck. Um, again, this, this thickness is about 1.5 millimeter and our little hockey puck included um, some of the unreacted surface that was covered with the PDMS, uh, just for reference of thickness. And then to the right of this, where my cursor is showing now, this is the reacted fracture surface. And using um, post-processing, using X-ray CT, we were able to look at the, the texture of the surface. And the, the major finding is that there, there was substantial dissolution of calcite as expected, but it left behind an altered layer, leaving behind a matrix of silicate uh, minerals with a higher amount of pore space. In the, with the question of how then will hydraulic properties for water and fluid flow through this fracture be affected by this, that's a really important finding because it doesn't necessarily say that the aperture of the fracture got wider. Um, a lot of calcite dissolved, but it, it may be that the aperture of the fracture remained somewhat constant. This, it, Here's looking at that again. Now we made cross sections of, of the reacted fracture. This is orthogonal to the fracture surface and focusing specifically on this reaction front uh, where unreacted rock is on the left and the reacted uh, that altered layer is on the right. And what you see is a huge amount of pore space has been developed. And with this image, we can 
look at the texture of this rock, we see that the, the calcite is in this rock exists as these small nodular um, granules. And you can see that when they disappear, they lead, leave behind these sort of uh, spherical shaped pores. But the SEM doesn't really tell us much about mineralogy. It tells us about texture. So the next image is, um, this is from uh, APS uh, Beamline 13 IDE, where we did XRF maps to look at elemental um, content of that same cross section. And what we see uh, in the far left is that calcium is completely de depleted from that reacted alter layer. Iron is not. Iron is unaffected, um, not surprisingly, and it, you can see it exists everywhere um, it, it, unaltered. Um, I'm going to skip talking about that petrographic microscope image unless there are questions. And now I'm I'm jumping to additional um, elemental map data here. I, I'll give a shout out to Ryan Tapero who generated this data for us at NSLS2. And uh, we'll start with the upper left. This is a gallium um, elemental map, which is a proxy, a proxy for aluminum. And it helps us to, again to look at texture. And we were interested not only in how hydrologic properties were altered, but we're interested in okay, now that we've created all this new pore space and surface area, there's now ac accessibility to minerals that uh, weren't previously accessible. And so we focused on arsenic because it's, it's an element of en great environmental concern. And it's also often associated with iron phases. So we have uh, across the top, iron, and, um, arsenic and iron, and thanks to the Zane's work that Ryan did, we also uh, looked at the um, oxidation state of arsenic. Um, arsenic, we found that the two primary oxidation states were arsenic minus one and arsenic five, and, and we, um, given the, the, the standards we had for Zane's, we, we believe that the arsenic minus one is associated with pyrite-like phases, the sulfides, and the arsenic-5 is associated with iron oxyhydroxides. Um, this, this is all I'm going to say about arsenic, but there's so much richness in this data, and there's more work that can be done here. The, the, this correlation plot in the bottom right, we wanted to look at the extent to which arsenic co-occurs with iron, but also you see the blue and red color to see whether the, the association fell along certain stoichiometric lines with respect to oxidation state. And there, there's, some, there's some information there, but basically the, the important finding that we published here is that creating this altered layer um, increased the accessibility of the fluid to arsenic that wouldn't have otherwise been there. Um, the, I'm jumping now to another inoperando experiment because I want to talk a little bit more about hydraulic properties. Um, a lot of my work has been about how do we how do these reactions in fractures alter the hydraulic properties, and this was an inoperando experiment we did in an X-ray CT. Um, system. This was not a synchrotron, but it could have easily been a synchrotron. This was the X-ray CT uh, um, set up at the DOE NETL lab in Morgantown, West Virginia. And so this was an incredibly ambitious experiment. And it's the type of thing like if I had known in advance how complicated this experiment would be, I probably would not have done it. Or I was just so lucky to have a really great graduate student who uh, tackled this. So in this experiment, this was um, XCT. So we used a cylindrical core that we fractured. That's depicted over here on the left. And we, we um, to do this in an in operando way, we had to set up the experiment in, um, in the X-ray source. And it had to be a rotating stage to get the 3D imaging. 
Um, this is also more complicated than the microfluidics experiment because in the microfluidics experiment, we did it as a low pressure experiment. We just used hydrochloric acid as the acid. In this case, we wanted to have a carbonate acid. We want to ha have CO2 acidified brine. And so we had a high pressure system and that made it even more complicated. Um, but I'm gonna show a little bit about what we learned at this experiment. Uh, so this, this was using an Amherstburg limestone, which is um, a little bit similar to the Eagleford um, shale that we used in the other experiment. And, and for this experiment, we, um, we project the 3D space of the fracture onto a plane, and then we look at the map of the fracture aperture before and after the reaction. And again, there was information with respect to time for this experiment, but um, but it did. I'm not showing that here. The important thing that we see is this really complicated evolution of apertures. And um, if you think about hydraulics, the fluid flow would be flowing, for example, from the bottom to the top. And even though there was huge increases in apertures in some places, there are these bottlenecks that, that were formed from the, the unreacted silicates that sort of form um, you know, persistent, narrow, narrow places. And that's very different from uh, um, another set of experiments now that I'm showing on the right, where it's often the case in, if the rock is mineralogically homogeneous, you get channeling. And there's this positive feedback between reaction and flow that leads to these deep channels. If there are deep channels, that's a problem in the context of the, the security of a, a cap rock. If, for example, there's this runaway positive feedback of reaction, then that, that's going to lead to deep channels and, and fluid flow. But, but the scenario that I think is more relevant is the one on the left where you've got a mineralogically heterogeneous shale and it, um, or evaporite in this case, and the, the hydraulic conduct activity doesn't increase very much because of the, the rock that doesn't dissolve. This is um, a result that we published where we, we then went in and simulated using um, uh, computational fluid dynamics methods. We simulated fluid flow through these fractures and the evolution of transmissivity, or you can think of it as permeability, the evolution of um, transmissivity in a channeling, in a, in a rock that is homogeneous and forms these channels, the transmissivity is like runaway. But if it's like uh, many natural shales that is mineralogically homogeneous, you don't get that runaway uh, permeability. It will increase, but it will level off. And that's, that's a very promising finding in the context of um, the security of these shales as cap rocks in the context of CO2 sequestration. I, I have um, another minute or two, I'm going to, I have two slides to mention about this machine learning approach. Um, it's not particular to these experiments, but we, we like many other scientists have made good use of the X-ray microprobes that um, generate XRF maps and, and have the capability for XRD. And the example is, uh, is the 13 IDE uh, beamline at APS. And here I'll acknowledge uh, uh, Tony Lanzarotti who helped us a great extent with, with interpreting the data in this way. Basically what I'm showing you is um, a, a neural network approach where we, oh, there we go, where we trained a neural network using the coupled XRF, XRD data that was captured on a very small scale. And then we, we after training a neural network on the coupling of XRF, XRD data, then we were able to use it in, a, in the context of a self-similar upscaling to a larger spatial scale to um, interpret only XRF data in the context of mineral maps. And I'll show you the results. So for example, um, 
XRF, an XRF map is shown here as an example, as a typical um, three element map. And through our smart mineral mapping machine learning method, we were able to generate these mineral maps from our trained neural network. And this is a, addresses the problem that XRD is important definitive data for identifying minerals, but it's, it's more, much more time consuming to acquire and interpret the next RF data. And so this gets around that problem by, by training, a um, training an, um, a neural network algorithm on a small data set and then applying it to a large data set. If anyone is interested in this, we're just about ready to publish this and we'd love to talk to more people if you have use for it. And then this is my last slide, um, which where I, I want to point out what a lot of you have pointed out, which is um, the, the multimodal capabilities of um, synchrotron beamlines has helped us so much. But in particular for us, the inter, inoperando experiments um, are becoming possible, giving advancements in beamline configurations and imaging resolution. Um, again, the machine learning tool we call Smart Mineral Mapper has enabled interpretation of micro XRF data to inform mineral abundance and spatial distribution. And finally, I'll bring it back to the big picture, which is that storage of CO2 in geologic reservoirs is going to require reliable, uh, secure, verifiable storage. And our results show that fractures in carbonate rich rocks probably won't je jeopardize storage security. Thank you. I wonder if there's time for questions. Uh, there certainly is, Catherine. Thank you very much. We already have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Adriana Hyman is asking, was arsenopyrite identified and is ars arsenian pyrite also present? In, um, in, in, uh, you know, we didn't have um, XRD in that, in that experiment, so we couldn't definitively identify it, but what, what, what Ryan Tapero did was he had a, a standard for for Zane's use for arsenopyrite, and it compared uh, nearly exactly to the Zane spectrum that we collected. Um, so that was our way of identifying arsenopyrite. Okay, and uh, Jianshu Duan is asking: Can XRF be coupled with XAFs for this algorithm, and how large a training set would you need to make it work? Um, I don't want to speculate about that coupling for us. The, the key was that we wanted to uh, do mineral identification um, where the micro XRD data was key. So uh, uh, I, I can speculate, speculate about XAFs. I will say that with regard to data size, so my student, Julie Kim, who is on this, uh, this Zoom meeting, um, she did all this data analysis and she'll be the first author on the paper. And she had about 200 data points, meaning pixels in an image where she had coupled XRF, XRD data. And so she did uh, for each one of them, the, the XRD pattern analysis and identified minerals. And then we ups, and that was like point, oh, that was like a quarter of a square millimeter. And then we upscaled it to, an area as large as 14 square millimeters easily. So it's, I think it's really an exciting development. Okay, there's, uh, there's a couple more questions. We, we have time. Uh, Quirina Rood, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, but, but uh, is asking very interesting in operandi experiment by Deng et al. How did you get the PDMS layer onto your sample? Um, yep, uh, I, I, I can't answer those specifics, but I, I partnered with someone in mechanical engineering who has expertise in using PDMS for these microfluidics. It has unique properties to adhere to uh, mineral surfaces. So it was able to seal um, to itself as well as to the rock. And uh, Carolyn Pierce has a question. Thank you, Catherine. Did you see opportunities for combining these synchrotron data with field scale spectroscopy, e.g. E spectrally induced polarization to get a better understanding of what is happening in the subsurface? Oh, that's, that's an interesting question. I don't have uh, an answer to that. Um, 
Perhaps we can talk afterwards so I can better understand the opportunity here. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Catherine? 